Hello, I'm Michael Hainsworth. Democracy is under attack by the very technology it's developing. Artificial intelligence has become a key tool of bad actors and rogue nations to undermine its rivals. National security is jeopardized by the use of AI in cyber warfare and espionage. Moreover, the rise of AI raises concerns about social stability and employment, demanding careful consideration. Meet Joshua Bengio, a professor at the Department of Computer Science and Operations Research at the Université de Montréal and the scientific director of the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms. Benjo says there's an urgent need for global cooperation and ethical frameworks guiding the responsible development of AI to safeguard both democratic values and humanity at large. He joins us now. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. You said that you would have prioritized safety over usefulness had you realized the pace at which AI would evolve. Is it too late to stuff machine learning back into Pandora's box? Uh... That's a good question. Probably. And uh, the problem is the it's pretty clear to a lot of people that uh, machine learning can bring huge benefits, economically speaking, and potentially military speaking. And so it's going to be difficult now to uh, get the, the cat back in the bag. Um, we can try, but I think we should plan for the case where um, it'll continue to advance and eventually surpass us in, in many areas that could be dangerous. It feels to me like a variation on every other Cold War weapon we've ever seen, uh, where you create one bomb that does this and then another one is built that's bigger. Um, and the perfect example that I, I had seen recently was deepfakes. The idea that AI was being used to create fake versions of people, and then we had scientists come up with ways to detect those deep fakes, and then the deep fakers just got better at it. Right. Um, and ultimately, it won't be possible to detect uh, malicious deep fakes. Um, one thing we can do is make sure that, uh, like, for example, the companies that, that build cameras, um, introduce some sort of um, encoding, watermarking, that says this is a genuine, this is a genuine picture, um, and then we'll be able to know. Okay, this is a picture we don't know where it comes from, but this is a picture that was taken by you know this company's camera. Um, but yeah, it's uh, right now the it's getting harder and harder to distinguish the fakes just by using some other machine learning. It's still possible to do it. But as, as the technology improves, it's going to get harder and harder. So we need to resort to other means that are um, uh, going to help us distinguish the, the fakes from the genuine. We could fall down a rabbit hole on just deep fake technology itself. I had a, a horrific conversation with an AI data scientist about the prospect of a United Nations General Assembly meeting being intercepted and a deep fake of the U.S. president saying something that he did not, in fact, say. But let's sort of take it back up to about a 50,000-foot view. What risk does AI pose to democracy? Well, so th no there, pressure. there are many angles. There are many places where it can go wrong and maybe some that uh, people haven't been thinking about yet. Um. To, to understand these, the, the, the key points is that we're building AI systems that can fool us um, through texts, images, speech, audio, or video, which is a combination. And in the sense that these can look genuine. Worse than that, with the texts, you can have a dialogue with an AI and you might think you're talking to a human being. And all of these can be controlled. So somebody behind the scene is programming the AI so as to achieve a particular goal. So that's the technology. And it's going to get better and better and more difficult to um, detect. So what can go wrong? Well, uh, we've talked about deep fakes where uh, a particular design is made to imitate something and um, and send a message that could be destabilizing, um, like like uh, presidents saying things and you know declaring war or whatever. 
Um, one that I think is more uh, insidious is influence on the electorate. Um, right now, there's not much control that's very efficient on uh, accounts on social media. So you could have zillions of accounts that are actually not human beings, or you know, at least it's an AI that's actually interacting. And they could be um, entering into conversations with lots of people, especially people that might have influence or that are on the border of uh, voting one way or the other way. And what scares me the most is if these kinds of things are deployed, they might learn through experience what works and what doesn't work to make people change their mind about some political opinion. And, and it might even one day get better than us. I mean, we are always trying to influence each other and each of us has uh, defenses against that. But who knows, um, uh, you know, where this could go. Um, but, uh, but just the fact of being able to scale up the troll farm is, is something dangerous. Uh, it could be social media, it could be email as well. Um, could be phone. I mean, so influencing people is, 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 a, is a major issue. Um, then you can have things like cyber attacks on the electoral, you know, infrastructure. Um, that's another kind, completely different kind of, uh, of threat. Right now, I think, uh, the, the systems are like becoming better and better at programming and not yet as good as the best programmers, but it could be different in two years from now. So how should nations safeguard their national security interests while also promoting collaboration in AI research and development? Yeah. Well, first of all, they should um, invest in research to better understand the threats. Because if you don't know what the problem is and what can go wrong, it's hard to defend. And that um, is connected to an area of research called AI safety. So AI safety is all about how do we make sure that um, AI systems behave well, maybe according to some uh, rules that we would like, some norms that we would like them to follow. So if a large company develops, uh, trains an AI system, and then it becomes, this system is available to anyone, which is currently what's going on. You, you want to try to, you know, make it so that it will, it will be difficult for these to use, for these people, like bad actors, to use the AI systems in ways that could be harmful or dangerous or threats to national security and so on. So that's one kind of research. Um, another kind of research is in developing AI that could help us uh, defend. So if it's cyber attacks, maybe we can use... You know, if if we have if there are AI systems that can design cyber attacks, then probably we can also design uh, AI systems that can help us defend against uh, cyber attacks. That can uh, monitor weaknesses in in our cyber infrastructure, or that can you know battle it out with this the the attackers. Um, there there are um, many possibilities there, and and there are similar considerations if you think about. Um, biosecurity, uh, chemical uh, weapons, and so on, where, again, AI could be used as a defensive tool as well as uh, by the attackers. And if the, if, the, uh, if the organizations that do the defense don't have the right AI firepower, then we're not in good shape because the, the other guys might be. Um, and to do this right... I think it's not going to be very good if each country does it, you know, in their little secret, uh, uh, usual way of doing things. But but uh, at least a few democracies um, should be collaborating together on this. There are a number of reasons why this should, you know, it would be a good idea, um, and share uh, what they're discovering so we can all benefit. I mean, share among themselves, not with the public. Right. Th th this feels like a variation on you know, the five eyes yes. relationship that five we have. Five eyes might be the good starting place, absolutely, for this. Right. So we're all working 
towards the same goal of, of fighting against rogue uh, nation states and, and bad actors associated with those troll farms and, and things of that nature. It sounds like at the end of the day, it's still a variation on the Cold War where we're just building better AIs than the other guy. And then when they leapfrog us, we have to leapfrog them as well. To what degree does that require a, a country like Canada to de uh, deploy resources to ensure that we are creating the kinds of people who can do this? I've been speaking with corporations deploying AI. And when we talk about the issue of where do you find good AI data scientists in Canada, they laugh. They're like, we don't need to find them in Canada. If Canada isn't making great AI data scientists, we can go anywhere in the world and work with them. Is there a, a, a critical need for homegrown talent that we're not really addressing? That's true. That's true. Uh, so, you know, there could be different parts of the kind of research I think is necessary. Some should be like top secret or whatever it's called. And probably only Canadians should be working on this. Um, although we can collaborate with, say, our, uh, you know, friendly nations. Um, but some of the research could be something less sensitive and would still be useful. So we can find room for people who are local and um, nationals and uh, also take advantage of foreign talent where, where it makes sense. And I think that's, that's, that's possible. By the way, Canada has a huge critical mass of local talent because uh, of the three AI institutes that the government created um, about six years ago. So we, we have an advantage uh, compared to other nations that haven't started as early in uh, growing that kind of uh, AI talent. How should various government levels be deploying AI for the good of its citizens? Well, that, that's, uh, that's a great question. So there are different aspects to the question. Um, first of all, um, there are beneficial applications that, that come, uh, you know, that, that will go the usual normal route of companies developing products that are useful. We just need to make sure that that development isn't going to be harmful. So that's the, uh, there's a, some safety issue there. There. Um, there are also applications of AI for which companies currently don't see enough profit or the risk is too high for them. I mean, financially speaking, but it might be very important for society. So think about some applications in healthcare or the environment, um, and, and, you know, things like that. Um, or, or where the horizon is too long and governments can, can help to, um, to fund these kinds of research projects. Um, then there is the kind of AI, which would be defensive AI that we were just talking about. Um, and one of the important questions is, um, how do we do this in a way that is going to be not just socially acceptable, but but uh, not threatening democracy itself. So let me explain what I mean. Uh, you have to understand that what's going on right now is that we'll, we're building more and more powerful AI systems, eventually leading to, you know, surpassing humans in many areas. The people who control that power can become very powerful. How do we make sure that that power is used, uh, you know, in a way that's beneficial for society? So we need to make sure that people who are doing this uh, um, are acting in the best interest of citizens and, and, and humanity at large. It, it reminds me of, of the, the Apple TV's got that new series based upon the books uh, called Silo. Don't you ever think about the world beyond the silo? What if what we see is not what's out there? Down in mechanical, there's always someone who has a theory about the silo. I need to find out the truth. There's the premise that the elected officials are the ones running this silo where people have been living after a big apocalypse. But in reality, it's the IT technicians behind the scenes pulling the strings. That's the kind of thing you're, you're suggesting we need to ensure we avoid. Well, yes. And I don't think we should completely trust governments. I mean, I'm, you know, 
they are the elected representatives of the people, but something can happen. And uh, there, you know, we see cases of uh, authoritarian governments taking over in democracies. You know, Hitler was one case, and there are some modern cases. So, uh, like Putin, for example. And so we need to make sure that um, the the governance of uh, these uh, AI systems, like the, the organizations that control these AI systems, is going to be robust. So, for example, it shouldn't be just governments telling them what to do. There should be representatives of civil society and even the international community to make sure that they're not doing something really bad um, and that uh, it's morally right what they're doing. Um, so we need we need safeguards even internally as we develop more and more powerful systems, whether it's in companies or whether it's uh, you know public publicly funded, uh, say for defense purposes or you know national security purposes. Because the tools are so powerful, we need to make sure that their the governance around them is going to be very robust and representative. I, I think back to the attempted grilling. American politicians gave Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg and the embarrassingly basic questions they asked him about how social media works. Do politicians and the bureaucrats who support them behind the scenes have the understanding of the implications of AI enough to design regulation and legislation to ensure that we use it for good? Well, not enough, but we have to do our best. Like It's not like someone else is going to do it. So um, I think government. one of the things governments need to do is to beef up its uh, AI talent, um, both, on the tech, both on the technical side and the policy side. Not just, I mean, usually they only care about policy, but, the, but here they also need expertise on the talent side. And it's going to be difficult to hire that kind of talent. Um, I'm suggesting that they work with um, uh, nonprofit organizations that, behave like startups and can hire, you know, the best people without those people being civil servants and all the complications that means. Um, um, so as to tap the, the the kind of expertise that right now is only employed in, in like uh, AI startups and some of the big IT companies. Uh, but, but yeah, one of the problems right now is that all of the expertise is in a few companies and of course in in academia and governments you know don't have the understanding and the power to do what they have to do so we we need to make sure that the right people get educated inside government um to better understand the issues and we need to make sure they also somehow acquire the expertise that they need it's very important for democracy because uh Governments are supposed to represent us, and if they don't know what they're doing, then uh, and in in on something so crucial that could transform our world positively and negatively, uh, that's dangerous. When CTOs speak candidly to me about their AI experiences, it's shocking. Stories of an enthusiastic employees uploading corporate databases to random companies they found on the internet, then distributing the AI results via email to colleagues seemingly oblivious to the violation of privacy and the remarkable security risks in doing so. It feels like the weakest link in machine learning continues to be not the machine, but the human. Tell me your thoughts about that Silicon Valley mantra of move fast and break things. <laughs> That's a bad idea. Well, it might be a good idea if you're, you know, building something that's not harmful. And, but, but, but otherwise, and this is the case for AI, uh, I think it's a very bad idea. Um, another, I mean, something that's part of your question is culture. Um, there is no regulation in computer science. There's no education about, um, uh, you know, uh, ethics and uh, about, uh, like, like doctors have, for example, or even engineers have some mandatory courses to uh, and to be an engineer, you, you you have to know some rules that engineers have to follow uh, that, that have to do not with the technical aspects, but with sort of the social uh, aspects and what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, all these questions like privacy and, and many others and security, they need to be taught. 
But right now, it's not even in the curriculum of uh, computer scientists, which are the you know those for the most part building the AI systems. So that needs to change, um, and it's going to take time. But in the meantime, one thing we can do is uh, provide um, like extra, you know. Um, non-curriculum uh, extra training to the, the people we hire um, or the grad students that are working in this field. The dinner party question I'm sure you get a lot revolves around job loss. Unemployment is a destabilizing factor for any democracy. How do we balance the use cases of AI against the needs to keep people employed? Yeah, uh, I, I heard this anecdote. I didn't check the history, but apparently... Um, when Hitler was elected, um, it was uh, after a three-year uh, in, uh, in a row of uh, un- unemployment uh, above 25%. Not the only factor, but, but clearly it's destabilizing. Um, so, yeah, we need to be concerned about this. And I think a lot of people who don't necessarily understand the 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 the, the security questions and others uh, worry about their jobs in the future. Now, it's funny because right now we are in a situation where <laughs> there are more jobs than people in, in a lot of countries like Canada. Uh, but yeah, it's it's likely that it's going to change. Um, and there are people who think that there will be new jobs created, and I think that's true. It's not clear if that will be enough to replace those that are lost. But what's clear in my mind is that it might not be the same people <laughs> who lose their job as those who get a new job. And because this is going to happen potentially pretty quickly over a few years, um, there might be a lot of people that are you know, in the middle of their career and far from retirement who lose their job and have zero prospect of uh, finding a new one. So this is going to be, this, this might be a big social problem. Of course, we don't know exactly how it's going to enroll and when and so on. And maybe you know different happening at different times in different sectors, but but clearly governments need to think about it. Um, so things like reskilling, social safety net, um, and you know we we have to think of all the options really um, in order to uh, contain the damage and reduce the suffering. MIT's Sandy Pentland, the University of Toronto's Jeffrey Hinton. In you, the three of you are considered the godfathers of artificial intelligence. How do you feel about that title? I, I think uh, really that's not the way science works. Um, it's it's a big collaboration. Uh, I couldn't have done would have done if it weren't for like the dozens and dozens of grad students in, in my lab over the years. Uh, probably hundreds now, uh, and all the collaborators that that I worked with, even from outside my my group, um, and uh, we build on each other's work. Like each paper is not only citing other work, but it, you know it, it takes advantage of the ideas that the others have had and proven in previous papers. So uh, when when I got the the prize, the Turing Award. Um, one of the things I said is it's, you know, it's not really a prize for us. Um, it's really a prize for the efforts of a whole community that made it happen. Well, Yashua, I appreciate your time and insight today. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Yashua Bengio is a professor at the Department of Computer Science and Operations Research at Université de Montréal and the scientific director of the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms. I'm Michael Hainsworth. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to the C.D. Howe Institute podcast with Michael Hainsworth. Subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. The C.D. Howe Institute is an independent, not-for-profit research institute whose mission is to raise living standards by fostering economically sound public policies. The Institute is widely considered to be Canada's most influential think tank and a trusted source of essential policy intelligence, distinguished by nonpartisan, evidence-based research and subject to definitive expert review. Visit cdhow.org and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you.